This episode, we're bringing you a beginner's guide to investing. And the very first lesson, according to our guest, is dispelling some common misconceptions on the subject. And to me, that's probably the biggest thing as people start into it. They think it's like, oh, I saw an interesting stock or someone, you know, at the office told me about this or and I was in a taxi and the guy was talking about it. Sounds like a good idea. I should do that. All they're lured by is the fact that somebody made a quick buck. That's Craig Maddock, Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager with Scotia Global Asset Management. You know, decades of compounding wealth? That's not exciting. This is actually kind of slow burn, boring stuff. But to me, that's investing. And if you do that right, you can have a lot of success. So Craig will walk us through the reality of investing and what it takes to build your wealth. From GICs to stocks and bonds to ETFs and mutual funds, and even some questions to ask yourself before you go to an advisor, we have all the bases covered. And before we begin, just a reminder to consult your own advisor before making any investment decisions. I'm Stephen Maurice, and this is Perspectives. Craig, thanks a lot for joining us today. It's great to be here. All right, we're going to get into our Investing 101 conversation, but I want to start with something that is simple, if not stupid. I hope it's not too stupid. But what does the difference say between investing and saving? Like, in other words, why can't we just chuck all our money into a savings account at the bank? Why would we want to be thinking about investing in the first place? That is a good question. When you think about, maybe as people start working, they make an income. Right? And your mm-hmm. concept around saving versus investing, I think, is a very interesting one. Because as people work, why do you work? You work to make money. Mm-hmm. You can decide to spend all your money now, or you can save some. Or, as you just mentioned, you can invest it. And what's the meaningful difference? If you think of saving it, it's really just putting it aside to spend it later. Mm-hmm. Right? Make $1,000, wait a month, wait a few years, whatever, and I'm going to spend the money right. fairly quickly. But if you're going to invest it, ideally what you want is when you come back to that money that you put aside, there's more of it. Right. It's grown. It's done something else. So what does investing do? It's almost like if you think about working, if you do really good at your job and get a better job, you can make more money. Right. Investing is kind of the same thing with savings. You now take your investments and if you can do the right things with it, it makes more money. It's right. worth more. Well, why would you not want it to be worth more? And then of course it opens up the whole doors. What do you need it to do? When are you going to spend it? How much more do you need? It gets really complicated really fast sure. after that, but it's really about trying to get your money to work hard for you. Right. Because your money will at least in theory, will grow more or faster if you're investing, depending on what you're doing, than it would if it was just collecting like a straightforward interest rate in a savings account. Exactly. Okay. Why do you think people are intimidated by the idea of investing? I guess we're talking here, you know, people who are maybe just starting out, as you said, maybe you got your first job, finally you've got an income, you're thinking about what you want to do with your money. It is kind of intimidating when you start to think about you know, what you might do with that. Yeah. Why, why do people find that difficult? It's not easy to invest. There's a lot of things that you have to get right. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of emotions you're going to go through as you do it, right? So think about that using your concept, right? Someone gets a new job, just started, now all of a sudden has the opportunity to invest. Mm-hmm. They've just worked really hard for this money. Now they put this money into this investment. What if they put the money in the investment and it goes down, right? not up? Mm-hmm. Right? You put it in sure. to make it go it's up. A possibility. So it's not just a possibility, it's a high probability. There right. will be a point in time through your <laughs> investing journey where your investments will go down in value. Right. And that's a hard concept for people to jump into right away. Right. Mm-hmm. So why is it intimidating? It's intimidating because people don't know. There's a huge amount of uncertainty. I'd say the other aspects that make it difficult for investors and why it's intimidating is they don't know what to compare it to or to frame it against. How do you mean? Well, you mentioned earlier, you can put it into a savings account. And it's one of the more simple investments or savings vehicles. It's like a guaranteed investment certificate, as an example, right? And you're gonna get a guaranteed return. You go in, you see what the return is, you either like it or don't, but you can put your money in and you know what you're gonna get. As you move away from that sort of savings type vehicle into an investment type vehicle, in order to try to get a better return, you ultimately open the door to the probability that you might get a lower return. Right. And most people do that because they want to get a lot more return. And now all of a sudden they start to compare it to other things, right? They compare it to maybe what their friends said they got or Mm -hmm. what they saw in the newspaper or something that looks really exciting or something looks awful, right? And now you open this massive door to uncertainty. And it's that uncertainty that ultimately causes people to have some concern around investing, why they should be worried about it. Because let's face it, if you grow your investments to a large amount and they're exposed to that uncertainty, it's not a good thing for you. You're not going to feel good about it. It could hurt you 
financially long term as well. And to me, that's, that's one of the big issues. It's that uncertainty that comes around with investing. So uncertainty and complexity, I guess. Hopefully, we'll talk about some of that complexity and maybe make it a little bit less complex as we go along. But it's also like there's lots of different things that you need to kind of figure out as you start to do it, right? Yes. Okay. What's the most common question or the most common misconception that people have when they start out investing? I think it's that they look at recent performance mm -hmm. of something, right? So say say they are con contemplating a potential investment. Right. Oftentimes they look at the past performance of the investment, maybe very short-term past performance of that investment. And they believe maybe that is a good reason to buy the investment. Right. And so to me, that's probably the biggest challenge for most people is they don't quite frankly dig deep enough mm -hmm. or they don't ask the question, what's the investment likely to do in the future? Right. And is this recent past experience for this investment a reasonable proxy for what this thing could actually do in the future? I'll use the GIC example. If you bought a GIC a few years ago, it was paying, I don't know, 3%. If you went to buy one today, would you expect it to pay 3% or would you ex expect it to pay what the current rate is on a GIC? Well, of course, you'd expect the current rate on a GIC. As soon as you jump into investing, when now there's variability around it, now the past performance, what it just earned, almost irrelevant or right. could be almost irrelevant. You need a whole different set of tools to try to figure out what, in fact, is this thing going to do in the future? How long in the future? What's your time horizon? What risk are you like to just the complexity does start to mount up pretty quick. Right. And I think that's the, the challenge for people. For sure. And lots of different factors that could potentially affect what the return might be on any given investment. Exactly. Okay. So you want to start making investments. What are some of the things people should think about before they go see an advisor? why they want to invest. And I know that sounds pretty simple mm -hmm. question, but I think that that's critically important. Right. Um, what are you actually trying to accomplish? So we talked about you could work and spend all your money. Right. You could work and save to spend a little bit of it tomorrow or the next day, or you can invest typically for something down the road. So retirement's one of the most common things mm -hmm. that people think about with respect to investing. And oftentimes we think of that in terms of, you know, it's decades away, right? So if you're just starting out in your career, you're just new to investing, you're probably not actually going to use this money or spend this money for many decades. And that's a different puzzle, right? So now you have to start thinking, okay, what do I have to do today to make sure I'm successful, I don't know, 30 years from now or from 30 years from now throughout my entire retirement? That's a big question. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, in today's society, like we're bombarded with stuff like every minute, right? So we are so much drawn into what's going to happen now yep. or today, not what's going to happen in the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years, which could be the lifetime of someone's investments. So to me, that's something they need to understand is what is it they're actually trying to accomplish? And then you almost can back out of that. If retirement's your goal, you can start to think, well, how much money do I need to retire? Well, again, it's a complex question because you need to almost infer how successful do you think you'll be in your career, which means how much income will you generate through your lifetime as mm -hmm. a worker, and how much of that do you have to put aside, so save, for retirement, but then you can only save so much. Most of us can anyway, right? So we're going to only put a portion of our earnings into something that may be considered for investing. Mm -hmm. And then we can add, you know, put those two things together and figure out how much return do you actually need. And what you quickly realize is the return you need from investing is much higher than you're going to get from, say, like a GIC, which is why most people get into investing. It's like, well, I need a higher return. So most people are brought into the investing world because they want a higher return than they can get in something that's you know fairly safe and secure. And that's when, in order to get comfortable from a planning standpoint or from an objective standpoint, you need to figure out how high does that return need to be? Because the higher the return you hope to get, the more risk you take. So that uncertainty factor we spoke of earlier, right. directly linked to how much return. If you think you need a really high return, maybe because your time horizon is too short or you haven't saved enough and you're trying to catch up, mm -hmm. you have to take a lot of risk. And the risk ultimately means that maybe you don't meet your objective. So for most investors, the goal, at least from my perspective, the goal is to get as good an understanding of the return you need and then try to maximize your probability or the chance that you'll get that return. Right. And most investors jump in too early thinking, well, I don't want just that return. I want like twice that return or three times that return, right? And then greed comes into play. They get really greedy and think they want a mm -hmm. huge return and unfortunately take oftentimes way too much risk, right. get burned or stung 
and then perhaps are very conservative investors for far too long. Right. So those are some of the risks that happen as people start to get into thinking about investing. So one of the things is you think about what it is that you're investing for. So you gave mostly the example of retirement, so a long horizon and so on, but people might be saving for they're getting married in two years or they're buying a house. We won't get into the whole registered thing, I don't think too much today, but people could save for any number of reasons. So I guess they want to look at the time horizon, like when they think they're going to need the money for. Yes. Yeah, actually, well, so that's a good example. So you mentioned like if it's a short thing, like you're going to save for a house or save for something. Mm -hmm. In those cases, because your time horizon is so short, the amount of compounding or the amount of additional growth you can get by taking risk to get a higher return probably isn't worth it. Right. In fact, the safety and security of your money probably is paramount because if you come back in two years, or say you put $50,000 in uh, and you're saving towards a down payment for a home, well, if it's a bad time to invest and your $50,000 becomes $30,000, right. that's a pretty bad thing from a house purchase standpoint. Right. If you think in long term, typically that volatility or that movement around of the risk tends to pay off over time. But sometimes you need the time. And if you don't have the time, your time horizon's too short, that becomes a bad decision, right? So that's right. where you want to make sure your time horizon's long enough so you can smooth out the ups and downs of some of the volatility. Okay. I'll start getting you to define some of the different options that are out there if someone wants to just start getting into investing. And um, you mentioned GICs. Why don't we start with that? Maybe you can explain a little bit more what a GIC is and under what circumstances someone might want to invest in that particular product. Yeah, so GIC, it's a, it stands for Guaranteed Investment Certificate. Mm. So with that comes a guarantee. So that's the nice part, right? It's typically issued by a bank. So you're going to basically get a GIC from a bank. Bank pays you a rate of return. The terms on those are typically like one to five years is sort of the range. So your money's in this guaranteed investment certificate, earning a rate of interest for a period of time. And locked in. Once you've put it in, you can't Most take it Most of them out are locked the in. There are right. some that are flexible, but generally, yeah, it's in this for a period of time and the bank is going to guarantee you a return. So nice, safe. Mm -hmm. So why would you use that? Well, it's more like that savings vehicle we spoke of earlier. You're not trying to make a ton of return. It's probably not going to be great for the long, long term because you're not going to get high enough return. Right. At least most people won't in a GIC to satisfy their need from an investing standpoint, but it's safe. So yes, if you were going to buy a house in a few years, put some money into a GIC today, a few years later it matures, you get your money plus the interest back. Fantastic. It's all there for your house, right? No concern, no risk. Right. But you didn't make it a lot of return, right? You made a, a small mm -hmm. return uh, right. generally in a GIC. So you're parking your money for a certain period of time, guaranteed return on that, no risk essentially, yeah. and the money will just be there at the end of that term. Okay. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on that, but like I guess over the last couple of years because of interest rates and their impact on bond markets and all that, we won't get into all that, but GIC rates have actually been pretty good the last couple of years, no? Yeah. So they're quite yeah. reasonable now, especially now relative to inflation. So as inflation's come back down, if you looked at the GIC yeah. rate compared to inflation, it's not bad. Yeah. Again, compared to where it was. You go way back, it was much higher. We went through a period where interest rates were very low and GIC rates were exceptionally low. You didn't right. get paid much to save. Right. In which case, a lot of people did move into investing because they realized that savings right. weren't good. When I was a boy growing up, savings rates were actually quite high and you can make a pretty good return just saving, mm -hmm. but that's not normal. So yeah, we're back to an appear where it's okay, but for most people's long-term needs, as soon as you get past a few years worth of what you're trying to do, really investing is where it starts. Okay. Everybody has heard of stocks, the stock market, stocks and bonds, maybe worth giving still a quick definition of what a stock is. What does that mean when you buy stock? Yeah. And I think if we jump off from a GIC, where basically you're giving your money to a bank mm -hmm. for a few years, as an example, and they're going to guarantee you an interest back, right? Right. It doesn't have to be a bank. It could be a bank, but oftentimes you're going to basically lend your money. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what you think of what a GIC is. You're lending your money to the bank right. and they're going to pay you back interest. A bond would be similar. You could lend it to a government. So you could lend it to the government of Canada, right. or you could lend it to a company. So a lot of companies issue bonds. Mm -hmm. So now you're lending the company and the company's going to go and do what the company does, right? Make goods and services, sell them, hopefully make a good profit and they're going to guarantee to pay you back the interest. The difference is that guarantee is not necessarily a guarantee. So as okay. soon as you move into a bond, as opposed to a GIC, yeah. now you are taking some uncertainty because maybe the company can't pay you back. And now for that, you typically expect a little bit higher return. 
Mm -hmm. So this is as you're sort of jumping from that savings into investing. So, well, gee, I I would like a little bit higher return. So maybe I will invest in a bond Mm -hmm. and maybe I'll use a bond from a company. So I'm going to lend my money to a company because I think that company will actually pay me back or they will offer to pay me back more than I can get into a GIC. Right. But through that, I take some risk Mm -hmm. that what if the company's profitability isn't that good and maybe they can't pay me back. And now I have some risk myself that maybe they're not going to be able to pay me back. Maybe they can't pay me back on time. Maybe there's some issues. But I'll take that trade off because they're actually offering to pay me more. Right. So now as an investor, I'm willing to take some risk mm-hmm. for that uncertainty. It's pretty certain, right? Most companies are profitable, continue to exist, pay back their borrowers. All that is generally pretty good. But you insert a small amount of risk in that mm-hmm. equation in order to get a higher return. So now you're starting to go from savings, in theory, to investing. Right. And now you've got that risk in the trade-off. So people will ask themselves, well, how much extra return do I have to take to compensate me for that extra risk that I take, but maybe they might not pay me back, or maybe not pay me back all my money, or I've got some issue. As you get into stocks, now you're going into an entirely different set of circumstances. So I'll use the same example of lending a company your money in the form of a bond. Instead of lending a company money, now you're saying, I actually want to own part of that company. That's probably the best way to think about a stock. You're really becoming a part owner of the company. Mm -hmm. And by becoming a part owner of the company, now you're saying, I'm going to share in all the profitability that this company can generate. So if they make things or do services and they do it profitably, if I own that company, I actually own some of that profit. Fantastic. Right? right? Right. That to me sounds like a good thing. Mm -hmm. So if I can find a company that is really profitable, it's making a lot of money and I can be part owner of that, well, guess what? I get the profitability that that company's. So if I could just stop you there, in terms of the profitability, how is that essentially distributed to the stockholders? Is that, are you talking about dividends there? Because I guess the alternative is either they're paying dividends, and I'm going to get you to explain that, or the value of those stocks is going up because the company is so profitable. Because you talk about sharing in the profits, how exactly do you- How do you get the profits? Yeah. yeah. So in its simplest form, let's just say you own the company entirely. Right? Now you can't, most people aren't going to go mm-hmm. buy an entire company, but if you own right. the entire company, just think about it. If the company makes money, net profit, right? So they sell stuff to people mm-hmm. and they hopefully sell it for more than it costs them to produce it. Right. And the difference is their profit. So just a simple example, mm-hmm. if you own the whole company, you get all the money. Right. In the stock market, what we basically done is, is create an environment where a whole bunch of people can own this company. You can have diversified ownership of the company. If everybody owns this company, how do they all get their, this profit, right? How do they share in that? So one is they distribute dividends, to your point. They can actually pay back some of the residual income that the company makes on an annual basis back to the people who own the company, or the company reinvests it. So this is sort of the company's two choices, if they make a profit. So they make money, choice one, pay it back in the form of a dividend, which basically you're giving people cash back because Mm -hmm. they owned it, almost like your paycheck, right, from owning the company. Or the company says, no, no, we're going to keep it. I'm going to take those profits and reinvest them. We're going to you know, use an example of a retail store. We start with three stores. We have some residual profit this year. We're actually going to open a new store in a new place. Right. And new store makes more money. So next year, hopefully we make more money. Right. All good if they keep selling more stuff and people mm-hmm. want to buy what they do. So if you own the stock or a piece of that company, you are sharing in that future growth and profitability. The big difference, however, when we talked about the bond, when you buy the bond, there's an implied return which mm-hmm. again, you can compare it to a GIC, you can compare it to something else. And you kind of know what you expect you're going to get out of that bond right. if you hold it through to its maturity. So similar to a GIC where it's got a time period, a bond also has a time period attached to it. When you buy a stock, there's not a time period attached to it. You're basically the owner until you decide to no longer be the owner. Right. So you're going to profit from that for as long as you own it or as long as the company's in existence or not. And you can choose to sell it at a later date. And of course, you've probably bought it from somebody else. So this all of a sudden now opens up the door for what's it worth? Mm -hmm. What price do you pay for this thing, this company that you're now going to own a piece of and share in the profitability of? And that's where the real difference comes in from, say, a bond or a GIC investment, where you're return is kind of known up front. Mm -hmm. In a stock, your return's not known. It's going to be a function of the future profitability, so the dividends that they might distribute of the profit, but also the price you paid for that. Because maybe you look at it and say, oh, I like the profit. This looks like a good profitable company. I think they're going to do good things. They're going to add more stores. Wonderful. I'd love to own this. But what if you have to pay 
I don't know, two or three times what it might actually be worth to get access to that. And that becomes the part of the risk in investing is, and this is where the complexity comes in, is how do you figure out what you should pay for that company or piece of that company? And that's the hard part. That's where people get, and I say, caught up when they're getting early into investing or trying to think through, and they oversimplify it typically by looking at, oh, here's a company and its stock price has gone up. You can follow the stock market all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, this company's done really well. It's gone up in value. Therefore, I should think about buying it. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily a good reason to think about buying it. You should think about what price am I now going to pay for it? What's it's likely to continue to grow in its profitability? And this is where it gets really tricky. What is the likelihood at the future date where I want to sell this company to get my cash back that someone's going to pay me more for this company? Mm -hmm. Start to put all these things together. This is where the complexity of the stock market comes in. It's exciting. It's mm -hmm. intriguing. It's interesting to own part of a company or parts of a lot of companies ultimately is how you probably would do it as an investor. But there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things you got to try to figure out and get right in order to get the money that you want. Right. To what extent would, because you hear this sometimes, to what extent would you compare investing in the stock market, and maybe it depends on how you do it, to gambling? Depends on how you do it. If you sort of went from the extremes, you go from savings, like we talked about, mm -hmm. to investing, and then the other side of that is speculation. Right. And the way we would look at it would be investing is thoughtful. You've taken into consideration all of these different aspects that we started to talk about there, right? So the future profitability of the company, the price you pay, you'd compare it to other companies. You can do a lot of things to get, mm -hmm. I say get smart about your decision, trying to make an informed, intelligent decision with all the information you have today, what you don't know is what will happen tomorrow, right? Like we go in with the best information. You can forecast what you think a company might do, and then the company either does it or doesn't. Yeah. And let's face it, competition's fierce, right? Other companies are trying to compete for the same space, and some may win, some may lose. Once you get into speculation, in theory, speculation is very close to gambling. And now you're not necessarily doing any strong calculations around what you should do or not, or maybe you did do some you know, calculation of what are the odds, but if you just go in hoping or believing that you're somehow smarter than everybody else and mm -hmm. that you're going to make a whole bunch of money. And oftentimes it's because something's done well recently, right? So you watch some stock, it's had a great run. It's like, I want to get in on that. Uh, there's a term called FOMO, fear of missing out, right? Sure. It's like, I don't want to miss that. Everybody, a whole yeah. bunch of people made a ton of money. I'm just going to put some of my money in that and, and hope to make the same thing. Well, hope to make the same thing sounds a lot like I'm going to buy a lottery ticket and hope to win. Right. Now, you'd hope the company's profitability gives you a bit more probability of success than, say, winning a lottery. But if that's your basis for the, call it investment, that's not really an investment. That's speculation. And to me, that's probably the biggest thing as people start into it. They think maybe that's what investing is. Right. They think it's like, oh, I saw an interesting stock or someone you know, at the office told me about this or and I was in a taxi and the guy was talking about it. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. I should do that. Right. All they're lured by is the fact that somebody made a quick buck. Right. What I spoke of at the beginning around, you know, decades of compounding wealth, that's not exciting. Right. This is actually kind of slow burn, boring stuff. But to me, that's investing. And if you do that right, you can have a lot of success. Okay, well, let's get back to some of the terms we're trying to define. And for lots of people, when they think about investing, the main thing they'll think about is mutual funds. That's what they hear about all the time. But over the last few years, something called an ETF has come along and it seems to be competing with mutual funds in popularity in terms of what people invest in. Can you define what a mutual fund is and then what an ETF is and then explain what the difference is between the two? Yeah. So a mutual fund is basically a professionally managed portfolio of things. So it could be stocks, could be bonds, but instead of you having to figure out, well, which company do I buy? In a mutual fund, you can buy a package of companies. So someone's gone out and done the work to figure out what are a number of companies that you could put together in a portfolio. So mm -hmm. package them up. Right. And now you're buying a whole, I mentioned before, buying a whole bunch of companies, right? You probably right. don't want to buy just one. You probably want to buy a number of them. And ideally, you want to buy a number of them in, that do different things, right? You might want some that are, you know, banks or financial institutions. You might want some technology companies. You might want some utilities companies or some of that make consumer goods. There's a whole bunch of ways you can make money. In a portfolio, you would typically buy a number of these different businesses mm -hmm. so that your risks are diversified, right? You're not only buying into one type of thing and hoping that's the one thing that will continually be successful. Right. So a mutual fund just packages all of those up. 
mm-hmm. that makes it very easy for an investor to get access to a broad portfolio of companies. The professional managed part, it does depend, right? So there are some that are professionally managed in a sense that there's someone or some people, could be a team, you know, constantly overseeing the portfolio, making those decisions, doing the analysis, more like the way I described investing, could also be speculation. You know, the process that's behind it right. isn't uniform. So the mutual fund is just the package of, say, a bunch of investments, mm-hmm. could be stocks, could be bonds, or some combination thereof. But how it actually is packaged up, who packages it up, is important. And the, the people managing the fund, are they constantly adjusting even like which companies would be within a particular mutual fund or how much a particular company makes up overall as part of the overall investment within that fund? Are they changing that much sort of on an ongoing basis? Or? Yeah, so the, the short answer is it depends. Yeah. So y- yes, they should, in my opinion, but mm-hmm. they don't have to. Right. So you can follow an active strategy. So where someone is truly being very active in their approach, constantly reviewing, and I'm going to say constantly, they're typically constantly reviewing all of the positions or stocks or companies mm-hmm. that they've put into the portfolio using stocks as an analogy. doesn't mean they're changing them every day, but they could. Right. So if something happens to a company where maybe you know they've run into some trouble or found something wonderful, that may change the attractiveness of it right. relative to the other investments that could be in the portfolio, in which case the portfolio manager would typically make a change, right. but they don't have to. But there are other strategies where maybe it's very passive. It's meant to be just following a long-term strategic approach and they've just diversified the portfolio and aren't really trading it around a lot and aren't active in trying to figure out the next thing. Right. And there's all points in between. You can have very concentrated portfolios of mutual funds, right? So maybe it's like only 25 different companies in there, and there could be other ones with thousands of companies. Hmm. So mutual fund in itself is not a homogeneous term. It's just the package. And you mentioned ETFs before as well. So ETFs is just a variation of the same package, if you will. So an ETF is an exchange-traded mutual fund. The difference being a mutual fund is not traded on the exchange, and all that means is how do you buy or sell it? So if you think about it, a mutual fund, when you buy or sell it, you're typically going directly to the institution that offers the mutual fund for sale. So Mm -hmm. they're facilitating you allowing to buy or sell the mutual fund. If you trade an exchange traded fund, so Mm -hmm. fund also, it could be exchange traded mutual fund in the term. That's not what we call it, but that's in fact what it is. The only difference is that mutual fund now is it traded on an exchange. And that means that every day to go buy or sell it, you're buying or selling it from somebody else. And earlier we talked about a stock, right? So I mentioned you buy a stock, you figure out what the price is, and then hope later you'll sell it at a different price. That typically happens on an exchange where two people are, they're meeting in an electronic environment to figure out the price. ETFs trade in a very similar fashion where that price is now between two investors who are now one person selling their mutual fund to the other versus a mutual fund itself where it's actually traded back and forth through the company. Okay, so just unclear on this. A mutual fund is a product that's created by a financial institution, a bank or another financial institution. They're making a decision about what's going to be in that fund, and they are the exclusive sellers of that product. Yes. An ETF is, I'll ask you a question around that, like who makes it, like who puts together this ETF, but then it is traded as a product as if it was a stock on the stock market? Exactly, yes. Okay. Now, the first part is the same. So often a bank or another financial institution will create the ETF, right? and oftentimes they'll create an ETF version of their mutual fund. Okay. And it's just a matter of how are they selling it or distributing, so how do they give access for investors to consume it. Okay. But it's otherwise pretty much the same thing. Okay, so what's the benefit of either one? Is it a question of fees that you're paying? Like, is there a fee benefit from one product or another? So oftentimes ETFs do not have any a distribution cost associated with them. So if you want to work with an advisor, you're going to pay a fee for that. So if you work with an advisor and you pay them a fee and then they buy and sell ETFs in your account, you've paid a fee for the ETF and you've paid a fee for the advisor. Typically mutual funds have an advisor cost embedded in the structure because almost all mutual funds are sold through a facility where an advisor is helping the client make the right decision. So it's just an unbundling of the cost structure, but the costs are still there. We talked in the beginning around, you know, who should invest or how do you get into investing and some basic mm-hmm. stuff. We just talked about advisors and just talked about advisors being licensed. Well, 
what does that mean? It means our trained professionals have gone through the right training to be able to give guidance on these things and to help people make the right investment decisions. That would suggest that for the most part, people shouldn't be making investment decisions on their own without the help of an advisor. So ETFs enable that in most cases, but you can do it with a mutual fund as well. And then just really depends on the licensing structure of your advisor as to whether they would typically use mutual funds or typically use ETFs. Okay. So in terms of like that process, I mean, if somebody wants to go and just manage their own investments, what would you suggest somebody do? They say, I'll do my own research. I'll buy my own stocks. Um, so my, my general <laughs> guidance would be, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> Only because there are so many advisors who can help people with that. It's, mm -hmm. it's almost like, I mean, to use an analogy like medicine or legal or I don't know, even fixing your car. There's lots of instructional videos on YouTube now to how to fix your car. But should everybody really be, you know, changing their own brakes? I know some people do, but probably the average person shouldn't, right? Mm -hmm. So I think in general, most people probably shouldn't. It really comes back to that difference at the beginning around investing versus speculation. Right. The average person, as they get into thinking about doing it themselves, are probably more inclined to think in the terms of speculation. They are not going to do the research. So, for instance, I'll just use an example. How many investors going out and doing their own research would actually read the financial statements of the company that they're thinking about buying? Right. Not many. How many would actually read the prospectus? The prospectus is the legal offering document for the mutual fund or the ETF they're about to purchase. How many would read that? Okay. Even though they sign off saying, oh, I've received it, they don't read it. Mm -hmm. So if you're not willing to do that, those are very basic things that a prudent investor would do, then I would argue you're speculating. In which case, your research likely was triggered off of, I saw something perform. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that it performed. I'm going to buy it in hopes that it performs like that again. And to me, that sort of becomes very dangerous. If you're thinking about investing for retirement, for most people, that means amassing, you know, call it a million dollars or more, right? In today's day and age, most people would be thinking in those kind of terms with retirement. Mm -hmm. You probably don't want to be doing that on your own, at least not if there's trained professionals who actually can help you, right? Or, and give you the guidelines or the barriers or the things to, you know, bounce those ideas off. You can be semi-self-directed, but to think you're going to do it all on your own and do it right, that's a huge risk, I think. Okay. Before we go, what would you tell someone who's intimidated about investing and is maybe on the fence about jumping into this? What's your guidance? So when I first started in the industry, I learned early on that it really wasn't the client's job to know anything about financial services ever. That was my job, right? So if, if they didn't do the research or do their homework, that wasn't going to hurt them at all. My job was to explore it, to work with them, to really help them. And that's still true today. So I just, I, I think the short answer is, People don't need to feel like they're alone. They don't need to feel like Google search is going to lead them down a path and all of a sudden now they should be thinking they're trained experts in investing. Most of us spend years getting trained to become experts at investing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a profession for a reason and we're here to help people. So yeah, I so say do your homework for sure. Do some rudimentary research, but find a really good advisor and trust them and you'll go far. Craig, that was really great. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. I've been speaking with Craig Maddock, Vice President and Senior Portfolio Manager with Scotia Global Asset Management. The Perspectives Podcast is made by me, Stephen Maurice, as well as Armina Lagaya and our producer, Andrew Norton. For a transcript of this episode, as well as other stories, insights, analysis, and thought leadership, visit our website, scotiabank.com slash perspectives. We'll see you next time. This podcast has been prepared by the Bank of Nova Scotia and is provided for information purposes only. Commissions, trailing commissions, management fees, and expenses all may be associated with mutual fund investments, including ETFs. Please read the prospectus before investing. The indicated rates of return are the historical annual compound total returns, including changes in unit values, and reinvestment of all distribution does not take into account sales, redemption, or option charges, or income taxes payable by any security holder that would have reduced returns. Mutual funds and ETFs are not guaranteed. Their values change frequently, and past performance may not be repeated. Views expressed regarding a particular investment, economy, industry, or market sector should not be considered an indication of trading intent of any of the mutual funds managed by 1832 Asset Management LP. These views are not to be relied upon as investment advice, nor should they be considered a recommendation to buy or sell. 
These views are subject to change at any time based upon markets and other conditions, and we disclaim any responsibility to update such views. To the extent this audio contains information or data obtained from third-party sources, it is believed to be accurate and reliable as of the date of publication, but the Bank of Nova Scotia does not guarantee its accuracy or reliability. Nothing in this podcast is or should be relied upon as a promise or representation as to the future. The information provided is not intended to be investment advice. Investors should consult their own professional advisor for specific investment and or tax advice tailored to their needs when planning to implement an investment strategy to ensure that individual circumstances are considered properly and action is taken based on the latest available information. Scotiabank includes the Bank of Nova Scotia and its subsidiaries and affiliates, including 1832 Asset Management LP and Scotia Securities Inc. Scotia Global Asset Management is a business name used by 1832 Asset Management LP, a limited partnership, the general partner of which is wholly owned by Scotiabank. Registered trademarks of the Bank of Nova Scotia used under license. Copyright 2024, the Bank of Nova Scotia, all rights reserved.